This meeting is being recorded. Great. Face looks nice. Nice. Yeah, man, it does look nice. This room actually has a pretty cool history um, in that. Um, so I'm in a place called Creation Audio in Minneapolis. This is probably the oldest recording studio in certainly in the Midwest. It was opened in by Bruce Swedian in 1956 or 58. Can't remember which year, huh. but it's a hundred year old movie theater theater building that has that I think it opened in 1916 called the Garrick theater on in Minneapolis. And at first, I guess it was a live theater, like a vaudeville style theater. And then it turned into movies in the twenties and at some point went into disrepair and Bruce Swedian, who is, if you don't know, is from Minneapolis. Oh, I didn't know. Turned, bought this building, leased this building, something turned the back half of the building into a recording studio in 1958. And it's still the same. And uh, several owners over the years, you know, I think Bruce left in like the early sixties and moved to Chicago, which is where he ended up meeting Quincy on a jazz date. And then that turned him into LA, but he basically started this as a studio. So it's, you know, it's a 72 year old recording studio. It's a rare wow. thing in America. Yeah. So, right. Now this and room, is this your yeah, place? Do you lease a spot there or is no, it I, I, yeah, I lease a spot from uh, a guy that's been a big mentor to me since I was like a teenager. This guy, Steve Weiss, who was an engineer uh, and who owns the building since the early eighties. And he, you know, he was like the, the one of the top engineers in Minneapolis and was front of house for Steve Miller band through mm -hmm. the eighties, basically. And uh, he bought this building and expanded on it. Not really expanded on it. I mean, it, here's the thing. It's, it's pretty historical in that uh, this building, I mean, let's see, the most famous song ever recorded in this building would be the trash men. The bird is the word. Oh, I know. It's if a, you know that one, it's a, it's, you know, it's apparently, you know, one of the biggest surf songs and surf bands of all time is from Minneapolis, the right. Trashmen. <laughs> oh, that's huge. I think that was, that was like 1961. And, uh, you know, the guess who made their first album here wow. in like 64. Uh, it was the top studio during the sixties. And, uh, at some point, there's a guy named Paul Stark that bought it, and it be kind of became the home base for Twin Tone Records, which was next door, which is like a Mexican restaurant now, but it used to be the main offices for Twin Tone Records. Who would have guessed that, that the record company would have gone out of business and the studio would have stayed in business? Yeah. Well, um, so in this room was uh, The Pleasure Principle by Janet Jackson was recorded here and produced oh, wow. by Monty Moyer. And uh, let's see, Paula Abdul did three her big three songs forever your girl opposites attract and the way that you love me with oliver lieber producing in this studio wow. um and then a lot of other just crazy records that you guys have never heard because it's minneapolis pretty how, much so. how many um control rooms are there at that facility okay so there's it's a it's a i could probably walk you through but i'd have to mask up well no you but, could just um, let's just look at your spot Okay. But there's other, you're saying there's, uh, it's other a, it's control a, there, there's three, it's basically there's, there's studio A, B, and C. I'm in B. Mm -hmm. A is big. B is, as you'll see soon, medium. And C is like a little small studio that is occupied by Paul and Ricky Peterson. Um, uh, brothers are awesome musicians that play with everybody. I mean, Ricky plays with Fleetwood Mac right now as a keyboard player. And Paul is in every band but he was in the time a lot of minneapolis kind of stuff going on here so that you probably never heard of you replace but, uh, the board in the studio um they yes i'm sure but i don't you know i don't know which records i know husker do had the back room you know they made their last two major label records in the back room in like 87 um i think it was was a candy apple gray that record or warehouses and stories. I can't remember which one, but those were made here. 
And uh, but right now it's pretty much a working. I mean, my room is just for me, but the back room, which is kind of a little more public studio a is a lot of sessions going through there kind of mm -hmm. day rate kind of sessions, a lot of jazz, a lot of choirs. They do big band stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, record lockouts for two weeks for people. You know, it's one of the better studios in the Twin Cities. So so I see a lot of your gear there, but it looks like you've got a computer as the center and the hybrid out to some analog gear. So can um, I switch directions of this camera during the. Yeah, I think you can. There you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, Get you so yeah. My, I, so this room was built in 1984, as you can tell by the color scheme mm. and almost hasn't changed since since then uh wow. and it was so when i moved in here it was you know it was, it was empty i moved in here four years ago from la and uh it was empty and i just rolled in these two racks right here and i had this old computer desk by omni racks and i just kind of jammed it in the corner and of course you know one of the big issues with today's studio computer screen meets working with a, a singer is that you can't see them if you got a screen in front of your face right and i've got this pet peeve against working sideways you know like you know you go into blackbird studio they got you on that computer cart and your left ear is doing all the work right mm -hmm. it's kind of an annoying thing that we've gotten used to so here i kind of just did not center my listening environment you can see it's wow. kind of kind of off to the right. And the idea is that I can sit here and I can see the singer right there and mm -hmm. I can see the drummer right there. Wow. And without having to, you know, sacrifice any left, right listening scenario. Yeah. So, uh, so and, you know, I have keyboards and, you know, so and also it's just it's pretty cool to be able to just reach over and grab your gear right there. Right. Let's let's look at some of those racks there. I see on the top rack you got some righteous stuff. Uh yeah, this is like a you know volume max radio ah, weird I have one of those. super CBS. compressor. I have four of those. Um yeah, they're you know, they do what they do. Yeah, they're great. Um, you know, that's ubiquitous uh UA kind of new gear. This is probably the centerpiece of my studio. It's the vocal mic pre, it's the mastering lab pre. If you've never tried one, it's the best mic pre there ever has been in the world wow. on a singer, maybe on anything. It's incredible. And then it goes into this retro and then 1176. Beautiful. And that's kind of the vocal chain. These three, yeah. those retros are so nice. It's nice. And that's just doing a little tiny bit of work. And then yeah. this guy eats up a lot of it. And then it kind of goes straight to Pro Tools from there. Gotcha. A couple so taking that... modules. Yeah original ones in the, you know, the army style case. These are just incredible built like a tank. Right. I just love daking gear. And I got some of his new stuff. These are the same things, but in a rack. And then these are Chandler TGs. And these are the API. They have volume outs. That's, that's another right. thing I have. I really need to have on my mic freeze. I don't like freeze that don't have output level. Right. And, so and you like to tell us why you like that well nine times out of ten you put a snare drum a 57 on a snare drum into an api module and then jam it into a interface and it goes over at its right. lowest and padded setting yeah and you're like what's the deal i can't even hit a snare drum and not be overing my pro tools rig so that's why I kind of have, and these it volumes. sounds so, you so know. different, right? I mean, the listen to a snare drum with it with that gain cranked, and you can just hear it. It's like an amplifier whenever you put your guitar into it. It's exactly, a totally different sound. And a lot of these kind of newer mic pre companies, a lot of them do now have volumes, but a lot of them did not have volumes. And API really didn't until they came up with this V version, which I really dig. This is a rack of five hundred EQs, so basically all those drum. These are pretty much the main drum mics. And they all go through this rack of EQs. And they rarely move because, you know, once you got your, your tones, you kind of, you know, leave them. I think there's an acoustic guitar that goes through this guy. And look, a roll off on the lows. Mm -hmm. uh, Transient Designer, been turned off box. for many years. That's a great box, though. It's really interesting. I don't own one, but I've worked with one. It's really incredible. 
it's a nice super compressor and uh, it's available on my stereo room mic. If I just, you know, jam that in, you get like super compression. And then it's the Clary Phonic, which is a Kush EQ that is on my Coles overheads, just to give it a little bit of sheen, if you will. And these are the Phoenix Audio DRS-8 mic pre's, which I really dig. The Jeff kind Tanner stuff. They're fantastic, but they also have little outputs, which is yeah. important. Right. That's, a Je that's Jeff Tanner's co company, if I'm not mistaken, right? I don't know. I think so. Jeff worked at, he's, if you look at Gear Sluts and there's ever a question about Neve, he worked at Neve. I'm almost positive that's his company, right, Mike? It's fantastic stuff. It be, you know, it's, I love it. Pair of pair distressors, mm -hmm. uh, the original Daking. This was like probably the first real like outboard or drummer, mic I mean. pre I ever bought. Uh, sorry, yeah, the drama 1960. I bought that in yeah. like 94. Yeah, that was all the that rage. Was, you know, when I had an AMEC console, that was the first outboard pre. This is a keyboard sub mixer that I have for all my analog keyboards. It's a it's a high quality Behringer Euro rack. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of gear, the Ibanez AD202. That is just basically there to send things to and print back to Pro Tools. Lead vocal, drippy, regenerative delays that have zero high end. And mm -hmm. you just jam that into a mix and it's incredible. Well, people would ask you, like, if you were not, if you hadn't spent 30 years in the music business, they'd say, well, why would you want high end in your delay? Tell them why. <laughs> uh, I mean, it just, you don't want to hear those S's and you right. just want it to like sit in the back of the mix. And, you know, it's kind of like an echo plex, but, you know, it doesn't have a tape. So it'll just, you can leave this thing on. And you, I mean, shit, I can, I can regenerate that thing right now with nothing going into it. Look at that. We're not going to hear it, but <laughs> you can just see it freaking out. And then you wing this delay knob, you know, on many tracks you uh, that I've worked on, you could probably hear that little effect. Um, Kemper, you know, kind of got to yeah. have one of those these days. Overstayer, stereo field effect, super great stereo compressor, followed by the Chandler TG1 kind of Abbey Road. Like nothing does that. Right. Except a million plugins now. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I have probably have had that for 20 years. So this is an extra outboard eight channel. Real quick, mic pre John, that, whenever yeah. you, when you're working, let's say you throw something out to that TGI limiter, you're printing it right into sort of storing your final result. In your exactly. Session. That's okay. kind of going through these. Actually, these two compressors are in series. It goes here, then there. And basically you'll have one in bypass or the other in bypass or both open and you'll just jam something through it like a piano or, and then just print it back to a new track. Right. Magic. And that's it. You know, so I rarely use it, but sometimes when I really want something super squashy that, you know, maybe can't be done in the box, I'll jam it out through that. Um, eight channel uh, audience. Basically this is just eight, kind of free extra mic pre's that I use that go digitally in through this crazy cable into my links. Hmm. Um, and I don't know how it works, but it works. It's like this crazy cable somebody had to build for me with like a Tascam and I, I can't even explain what it is, but it uh, basically gives link? me... Is it the toss link? Just a, like a... That sounds right. Yeah, it's a toss um, link, but the is idea the is, protocol. You know, my main, uh, the Orion Antelope is my main interface, which is 32 ins, 32 outs. And then the links is the additional 16, 16 mm -hmm. digital. And then you can jam on an additional eight. So I have 56 ins. Wow. Um, and then all, and then, you know, like a helix on the floor, mini Moog, Whirly, a uh, bunch of amps this, that go out to a is... cabinet in the basement. Your studio is kind of like, it looks like a laboratory of just like a, a madman, you know, like the Todd Rundgren of modern music, you know? You it's said like, the magic word, Joe. What's that? Todd Rundgren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, But Todd, I'll show you that later. Hey, did, you ever, did you ever get a Todd's room up at Bearsville? No. He had the I, theater I down in town, and it was just like, I was up there for a record, and it was just like 
it was like anything could be moved into an area and created with, you know, the, it's a cool, like you go into a studio and everything has a purpose when you go into a commercial room, but seeing you, you're in a commercial space, but it's like, it's almost set up like it, anything could be shoved out of the way and, and be used a different way. It's just like, yeah, whatever you got to do to create. You know, what's weird is like, uh, I mean, I said, I don't share or anything with, with another person, so I can leave it the way I want it. And I've kind of had that since maybe, 2007 a long time but like I, you know back in the 90s I, I i there was other engineers that would come in and do night sessions so you had to clear the console and all that but here i just leave it all up and that's the 56 ins thing everything's up you want right. acoustic guitar 33 you want a stereo upright piano you know 55 and 56 or you know it's just they're all kind of and then you've got a you know a master sheet that kind of tells you well that's a brilliant where thing there is. that people don't know john it's like uh, how does this guy manage all this and it's like it's just you saying that makes it so simple to me it's like oh i want a piano i go through my piano settings i go through my piano yeah inputs. we're not auditioning mike pre's at this point or a being stuff it's like i've done the a being for the last 30 years right um every but once, every in, a once while, in a while someone will show up and show oh, you yeah, something absolutely Hey, I buy gear. I'm I'm just I'm crazy for gear and I buy stuff all the time and I switch it out and you know, you'll see some of that along the way. But generally speaking, um you know, it's 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 I kind of know what I like at this point, so right. I just it's a lot easier. Well, and that's why your it's, phone you know, rings. People come to you for what it is they, that you've done. They want You know, uh, want another that. thing that happens is like I'll go to outside studios, like I'll, I'll go to LA or Nashville or wherever. And I pull into a really nice studio. And you know what's funny is the first day, the first thing I do is I set this up. Like, I need it all the way I need it, you know, which right. is, you know, I need to have my inputs. I need to have my chains so that for the next two weeks working at Blackbird, I never have to touch anything. I don't need an assistant to the patch. And uh, the rare time that I do go outside, it's funny that I spend the first day basically rebuilding this kind of setup. Yeah. All right, you were, I'm sorry to interrupt. You show you were showing us your wall over there with your very Mew and the DBX. Uh, yeah, this is kind of extra stuff that's not that involved. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But yeah, DBX 165. These are Eric Valentine modules. Um, Manly very Mew, which I've had since it came out. I love that thing. Another uh, overstayer. MAS. This is like the original filter factory, you, you know, back in the acid house days. I know Shim Shack would use that thing, I bet. <laughs> uh, the best mic pre, second best mic pre next to Mastering Lab of all time, the PV, the MP2. I love them. Tube mic pre's. If you ever find them for, you know, buy them because they're great. A couple more 165s, another backup AD202 in case that one ever breaks. A Moog analog delay, which is actually also patched up for like a left right thing with the with the ibanez so you kind of have two different settings and you can just drip off the lead vocal left hard right two settings these are lindale module there's todd rungard looking at his hey, even tides which is great um another rack over here uh pod bass pod xt pro was my bass sound until I recently changed it, but I love it. This is the original Cintivox vocoder, which oh. uh, is amazing. Is that the original? Is original? A, oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's the one you were asking about, me, Mike? No, nah, the one that I was telling about your uncle's. Uh... Oh, yeah. Well, this is the Funky Town vocoder, the Moog vocoder. This and this Cintivox. This is what he got after the first album. He moved to this one. So on the third lip sync album, you'll hear the Cintivox, which is a and little those, easier to use. And for those who are going to watch this out of context, um, John's uncle wrote, performed, uh, did the whole thing, had one of the biggest hits of the century with That's Funky true. Town. Yeah. And that was That's the, true, voc yeah. the vocoder from it up yep. on the right there. And that's kind of why I moved to Minneapolis was because of him. Basically, I'm from Boston, but I moved here, you know, when I was 18 and ended up staying. So uh, remember this one? Dolby A. Yeah. Yeah. The old the old 361 with the cat C card. Yep. That's the old cheat, the Dolby situation that, you know, 
the old, you know, you would send the vocals. This is back when, on analog mixing. You would send the vocals through it or whatever you wanted, extra high end, which is, it was crazy, but we still did it. Bring it back on an aux channel. Here's a PV valve verb, a fantastic um, tremolo and tube reverb kind of rack mount thing. Instant flanger, a uh, couple sans amps. That's the vocoder, line six green boy that everyone loves. And this is one of the weird, rare UA uh, solid state mic pre's. Mm. No output. I Actually, love that you got mic pre's all over the place. Like they're not like in, yeah, mic pre's all over. They're not in the mic pre section of your room. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, our SE four for like the you know glassy string ensemble vibes uh, uh juno 60 midi controller that has speakers i i love having a keyboard in my control room that you can just you know play oop, powering it up you know speakers coming right out of it like you want to just fool around with the song what key are we in what should we do you got to have a, a keyboard in the control room that has speakers like so that. that's you, this room. Do you use those far field monitors, the ones up in the ceiling? Yeah. Okay. So that's another thing. So when I moved in here, there, I'm going to split back. Did that work? Nope. Hold on. When I moved in here, there were just kind of, they were red squares, but they, they had soffit mounted speakers here back in the 80s, but they had pulled them out. And I wanted something up there, but I didn't really want to spend big money on it because I just don't spend a lot of time up there. So I bought, these are Sirwin Vega wedding band I speakers. I say, are they Sirwin Vega? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, pretty much they're loud. The bass player likes it, you know, yeah. it's, and you know, but it's, there's a subwoofer, this big ass box right there. And it, the whole thing is literally what you would bring to a, uh, a DJ party. To a, pretty much. So, and then I got a TV up there and, so let's see. I'm going to flip around so you can kind of see the window goes out into the live room. Oh, and I'm wow. going to walk out now through the hallway. So that's Nicollet Avenue out there. So now I'm in the live room. And you can see the, this is the singer position right here. Right. And you can see, he can, you know, you can see my face right there. Singers it, standing what right here. What mic is that? Is that a that's it's not M49? Yeah, an M49. And I got this kind of system. I got a, like a bunch of these multi track analog, 16 channel analog mixers. I, I prefer that to the, like the whole Ethernet vibes. Just, I don't know why that is, but <laughs> uh, guitar amps, bass amps. I also, you know, I play in a Beatle band and we rehearse in here. We do like authentic recreations of Beatle albums. Or we did do that. Uh, so we rehearse in this room. And you can hear my B3 and Leslie whirring. This is my basically one of my drum setups. Coles. I like Bayer. Bayer. I don't know how you say it. Yeah. That's so, the M88. Or no, that's the M160. 160. There. Yeah, M88's in, in my kick drum. Mm -hmm. Using the 201s on the toms. These I bought from the Michael Kamen. You can see they say... Uh, Upside down, but they say eligible music. I bought these from the Michael Kamen estate back so in that, LA. That um 160s is a ribbon mic, but the M88 is a dynamic mic, right? Yeah, that's an SE V, what is it, VK7 or something like that? I can't remember what it's called, but a super hyper cardioid. This is a warm audio 47 and a sub kick. Mm -hmm. But this, this, the M88 is my kick mic. I can pull it out of here. Yeah. And pretty much. It's a new one, but it's great. I mean, look, it's good enough for Phil Collins to sing into. I was just watching uh, the Phil Collins documentary, and he was singing through that. I was trying to remember I, who it how was. Do you love, I mean, how amazing is that? You're, you're, you're watching, like, huge hit songs being sung through a dynamic microphone. Right. And it <laughs> shows you right there, it does not matter. It does so, yeah. You know, and vocals are the one thing that you could throw it all out the window. An SM57 will beat out a $10,000 Telefunken. Right. So, uh, you know, A101 going into a Leslie. There's a little back booth here. What a great space you have. We're losing you. Uh, 
it was dirty rock. <laughs> I guess we can just storage. Wow, look at that. Uh, C7. Did that this come also came from my uncle. Oh, it did. Wow, dude. There's, you can see he, he signed it when he gave it to me. That's awesome. That's um, beautiful. Then I have, this is my wife's grandmother's piano from a farm in upstate Minnesota. Just an amazing sounding, like, you know, just a janky piano. A pair of these Latins on it. And, you know, gear everywhere and right. like my old studio, Funky Town. And I think on this, I've got a pair of KM184s at the moment. And the headphone boxes are always there. More gear back there, which I, you know, I don't use the bass gear anymore. <laughs> but uh, so that's that. Wow, dude. What a great, what an to... incredible place to create in. Yeah, you can so, feel the vibe even through the camera. It's cool as shit, man. I love it. So let's see. What are, what are the so here's a question. By the way, say say that again. What are the KRKs you're using? They're the KRK V8s, which are the new the new model. I I absolutely love them. Can I switch to my other rig now? Yeah, let's. Th this will conclude our studio tour of John Fields. What's the name of your studio? Creation Audio Studio B. Okay, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So what, why don't I join over the Zoom? And, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go to the podcast or search uh, the John Fields actual interview we're, gonna, we're about to do. Thanks so much for showing us your studio, buddy.